Good day, guys, and welcome to another episode of the ATP Project Podcast. And you are with our hosts, Elisma and Steve. Hello. Hello, Steve. How are you today? Oh, very good, thank you. That's good, that's good, because we're talking about jeans today. That's right. I'm not much into fashion, but I know they make my butt look good, you know, so... (laughs) No, it's not those jeans, is it? That's right. These no, other jeans, not. aren't they? It's a different jean. It's spelled with a G. A G. Yeah, mm. not, a, not a J. Not a J. So Although I'm sure, I'm sure they make you look good. I know G's make my bum look good too. The old G strings. <laughs> so, but um, we shouldn't really talk about that today, should we? <laughs> Probably not. We should be talking about jeans now. What are jeans? What are they? You're asking the question? Oh, no. (laughs) They're amazing things that carry information in our body. And we're all pretty genetically the same. We're about 98% the same as as chimpanzees. Uh, We're very, very similar. We're 99.9% genetically the same. You've got two X chromosomes. I've got an XY chromosome. We know genes control things like our eye colors, hair colors, and all these sorts of things. And that's what we're going to talk about today and how they relate to diseases. Yeah. Isn't that incredible? Oh, it is. And it's such a huge field, Steve. I mean, um, you you have your nutrigenomics field, which is looking at the interaction of nutrients or diet um, with the genes. You know, then you get your gene editing field where they use CRISPR technology and things like that. Um, There's, you know, a lot of research going on in that area, which, you know, is a bit of controversial. A little bit. Uh, (laughs) But there's so many different um, aspects to to genes. You know, some yeah. some you know it is used to kind of like diagnose diseases, uh, yes. and, and uh, there's a lot of genetic diseases around there. But mm. uh, more and more people are now using genes as well to kind of help and prevent chronic disease or improve their health or um, you know. Um, you know, all kinds of things like that. So, Amazing. yeah, a big field. Amazing, because because in, in the olden days when I was trained, there, there was a few genetic diseases like Huntington's chlorella, where that means that if you had the gene for that, by the age of 40, you would get Huntington's, which is a horrendous neurological disease. But now we know there are genes that make you more susceptible to certain diseases, and there's genes that are protective against certain diseases. So we're going to be talking about things, big, big words like polymorphisms today, alleles, haplotides, all these sorts of weird things. So, I mean, you know, just going through the list of what we're going to be talking about today, um, polymorphisms is is a, is a weird one. Mm. Um, you know, and, and I've got a wonderful polymorphism I've spoken about it before, and people are interested in this. It's called the human leukocyte antigen B27 yeah. polymorphism, and it's like, what the hell is that? Well, that encodes to a wonderful disease that I had when I was 20 called ankylosing spondylitis. Not and such a wonderful disease. Not a disease, wonderful is disease. It? I was in no. hospital with the bloody thing. So so I've got this gene that, that means that I'm highly susceptible to that and naturally I got it. But I haven't got it now, but I've still got that gene. In fact, weird story. I went to my GP about a year ago and I wanted her to sign something to say that I've got this musculoskeletal disorder because then I get um, you know, this health fund thing back. And she said, no. Well, we've got to get you tested for that because you've got no symptoms of it. So sure enough, I'm genetically got ankylosing spondylitis, yet my back's fine, my knees are fine, my everything's fine. I don't have anything with it, but genetically I've got it, so she signed the form. Wow. So there you go, 250 bucks from my health fund because I've got a musculoskeletal disorder. But luckily you don't have any of the symptoms. Don't have any of the symptoms. I don't have any of the symptoms. So genetically I've got the disease – but I haven't got the disease. <laughs> so, so it's sort of like, you know, it, it makes you more susceptible to, to those diseases, but it doesn't mean you're going to get it. So it's, it's a really interesting story because genes, you know, and, and then we went through the period where we were testing people's genes and say, oh, you've got that gene, therefore you're, you've got this. But we know that lifestyle can can change this the environment yeah, huge i'm so glad that you that you said that you know, because we kind of like um we're constantly looking for genes to to i guess link or associate with, with a disease and it's very true like when people get these genes tested and they've got a gene they're like oh well mm. this is this is it now um i just have to um you know accept my my fate mm. and it, it's not really like that is it no you know, no so because these genes can be switched on switched off in general we want to keep genes switched off, uh, off mm-hmm. most of the you know most of the time mm-hmm. uh, and it's only when some of those uh, disease causing genes get switched on that yeah. you actually present with some of the symptoms it's amazing isn't it because you've got you've got your genes there which you know everyone's got 
Uh, and then you've got this thing called epigenetics, which epi means beyond genes. Mm. And I mean, how incredible is that field where, where you've got these base genes that we're all pretty similar with, but then you've got on top of these, the genes expression and, and you can change this. Yeah, so it's you can, huge. You can sort of like ca- change your genes, you know, in a way, yeah. but you can't change your genes. They're, right. they're set up like that. It's incredible. Yeah. What, so what a field. There's a, there's a lot of studies that have uh, shown that um, the genetics um, aspect make about, you know, 10 to 20% of the importance of, of developing a lot of uh, chronic illnesses, right. uh, whereas uh, the epigenetic aspect mm. is more like 80%. Wow. Um, and epigenetics is lifestyle it's Mm. our diet Mm. it's our exercise it's our sleep it's our stress levels Mm. it's what we get exposed to all the chemicals we get exposed to um it's what happens in everyday life and that's the stuff that really matters and that determines how your genes Uh. you know uh, perform it's amazing. Like, like, you know, a lot of people who listen to this podcast will be familiar with the, the methyl tetrahydrofolate um, reductase polymorphisms, the 667 and the 1296. 1290, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they see. That's right. That's right. And, and these play a role in methylation in the body. But there's so many. I mean, I, I know you've done a lot of work on catecholomethyltransferase. Mm. And and those genes, and I mean, and then you were talking to me this morning about something fascinating about the the double positive and double negatives, and yeah. I, I want you to tell everyone about that. It's a fantastic. Oh, thing. it is. It's it's really really cool. Yeah. So there's a thought. You know, some of our listeners would mm. be very new to the whole yeah. epigenetic or the gene stuff. Yeah. But some of them, you know, would already be familiar with the MTHFR. Yep. And you know, there's so many companies out there that do gene testing, mm-hmm. uh, more from a nutrigenomic perspective, so not necessarily disease testing. Mm-hmm. But they check for things like MTHFR, but also um, there's many other ones. And one of them is COMT or the catechol O-methyl transferase, as you mentioned, yeah. Steve. Stupid long um, word. Another one. Sorry about that, people. Uh, a, very, a very big one. Yeah. And so there's a couple of studies, right? So um, so, so just basically COMT is, is, is really good for dopamine and, you know, estrogen metabolism and these sorts right. of things. So sorry, That's right. So if you, if you have if – if your COMT enzyme works really fast, mm-hmm. uh, that means you break down estrogen very quickly, but also yep. your stress hormones very quickly. Mm-hmm. If it's slow, you break it down slower and you're mm-hmm. more inclined to have the estrogen-dominant symptoms and – you know, high stress levels and things mm. like that. So it's a, a big one, mm. especially in, in females. And so a lot of people who do gene testing, you know, usually, you know, when they when you get your test results, there'll be a plus plus or a minus minus. Mm-hmm. Now there's always two because one gene is from mum and one gene is from dad. Yes. Right. And so you don't this you don't know which one you get from mum and which one you get from dad. So sometimes it can be a plus plus, sometimes yes. it's a minus minus, and sometimes it's a plus minus. But there's always two numbers there. Yep. Now with the COMT variety, if you have a plus plus, it generally means uh, and this is specifically I believe the V one five eight um, the V158M1, I think. I don't know if I have it here. Yep. Um, but I think that's a variety they test for. Now, if you have a plus plus, it generally means that that gene works slower. Right. If you have a minus minus, it means it works faster. Okay. So generally, you know, you as we know, our genes are our genes. They don't change. No. Like you d- just test them once. It's not like they're going to change. That's right. It's your blueprint. Hmm. Now, a lot of people get their genes tested, but they sometimes will use different companies. And so supposedly it's supposed to be the same across, you know, it doesn't matter which company you test it for, it should always come back it's the genius, same. Yeah. But we're finding now that it doesn't. Like in some, you know, some companies, someone will, will maybe come out with a plus plus and then they use another company and comes out with a minus minus. And it's mm. like, well, what gives? Yeah. Right? Why would you get two different that, results on sus. exactly the same gene? Yeah. Now, wh- one of the things is that with research, it's kind of like advanced mm-hmm. uh, over time. Like, um, they used to just look at single uh, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, which is a SNP. SNPs. Some, yes, yeah. Sometimes they call you it might have SNP. heard the term SNPs. Yeah. And so uh, the, the research generally is based on the single nucleotide polymorphisms and testing these genetic mutations in a test tube. Right. And when you test this, that COMT variety in a test tube, then yes, it comes back as a plus plus or a minus minus. Sure. But what they're finding is that you actually get these things called haplotypes. And so haplotypes is when you have a cluster of mutations on the, of the same gene on a chromosome. Yes. Right? So instead of just looking at one, um, one genetic polymorphism or mm. one mutation, you're looking at four mutations of the same gene on 
a, a chromosome. Right. And they're finding when you actually combine those four that you get completely the opposite results. So essentially wow. the test tube studies is theoretical, yeah. but it's not really how it works in the body. Practical, and so yeah. some companies will actually test for the haplotypes, which yeah. means they don't just test for the one single nucleotide polymorphism. They'll test for the haplotype, which is four different polymorphisms, mm. and, and then they find different results. But that's actually more accurate. Yes. But this is where a lot of people get confused because they get different gene results from different companies on the same gene. Ah, so incredible. I think that's a, you know, a lot of that will kind of like change. Um, and I think it's very important for people then to really make sure that the companies they choose to get their genes tested, you know, uh, test for the right genes. Of course they do. Okay, so let's say I'm, um, say I'm a woman and um, I have got a slow metabolizer of estrogen, which means that I'll be double positive, And therefore I will have slow metabolism estrogen and dopamine what what would be the the sort of symptom picture that i could you know relate to what would be my yeah so if it's slow well like i said the estrogen dominant stuff mm. right so that's the heavy periods mm. um you know the the whole pms some you know all those pms symptoms the headaches and the irritability and all of that mm. um you'll also tend to probably around the time of your period um you know or when estrogen is really high so just before your period i should say when estrogen is really high yeah. you'll probably feel a lot more irritable and that's what a lot of women say like the week before my period i'm just you know i i'm stressed i can't you know handle my children my husband or what have you and a lot of them have that comt polymorphism because you re imagine like a, a gene because uh, a gene encodes for an enzyme and the yes. enzyme in the gene is the same name so comt gene encodes for comt enzyme correct and an enzyme is a bit like a door yeah and through this door you uh, with the comt you need estrogen to go through it yeah. and you need dopamine and all those other stress neurotransmitters mm. to go through the same door right now if you have a slow comt it means your door is very narrow correct and so you have now you know the week before your period you've got all this estrogen that has to now squeeze through this door uh, and the estrogen is going to squeeze through that door to be metabolized and it's not going to leave much space for all the stress hormones to go through uh, so they build up and they build up and they build up and you know um as, as, as women, we feel more irritated, more irritable. Um, and that would be a very typical kind of a pattern for a woman who has a slow ah. COMT. Okay. So slow, you know, they can be irritable all the time. They can have these PMS symptoms. Um, and, you know, again, they can be tested for this and it may help them explain why they're feeling like this. And I guess... The, the next $50 million question is, well, what do we do about that? If it's our genes, it's like, you know, what can we do about it? Now, the first thing I think off the top of my head is stay lean because if you've got a lot of body fat, you make more estrogen. And if mm -hmm. your door's only so wide, you're going to make all this estrogen and it's not going to shove it down. You may therefore not want to supplement with estrogen like a lot of women do, or a contraceptive pill or um, HRT, these sorts of things. What else should these women, um, you know, can they do anything about this excessive estrogen and catecholamine buildup? Absolutely. I mean, you mentioned the MTHFR gene yep. earlier, right? So um, without getting too complicated, the MTHFR gene is kind of like the beginning of a process we call methylation. Yep. And that methylation process is needed to make a substance called SAM, yep. um, Yes, adenosyl methionine. Yep. There you go. And that SAM is needed to make that COMT enzyme work. Gotcha. So you can, uh, you know, we know that MTHFR is pretty much the gene involved in making activated or bio, uh, bioavailable folate, yep. which is the 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. Um, and so, so kind of like taking nutrients, like, you know, making sure you have your, your folates right, your B12 right, mm. all of those, you know, magnesium, there's a lot of nutrients that play a role there. So you can make SAM, so you can make your COMT enzyme work uh, plays a huge role. I mean, magnesium is another very important mineral for that COMT enzyme to work as well. Mm. And one of the biggest things that can affect that whole pathway is synthetic folic acid. Well, that's got to be folic acid is what everyone recommends, isn't it? Isn't that the good one? No, it's oh. not. It is, it's synthetic and it's yeah. put in all these fortified foods. Right? Really? Uh, all your cereals and... Like uh, this proper... Oh, is that for something I prepared earlier? <laughs> Well, you know, I'm, I've, I've brought this in for some other reason, but I'm just having a look at this here, and it's yeah, it's 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 fortified with folic acid, which is surely a good thing, isn't it? 
Well, no. I mean, no. folic acid, first of all, it's, um, it's, it's kind of like uh, uh, slows down a, a, an enzyme or a gene called DHFR, which is your dihydro, uh, dihydrotetrafolate. Yes, That's right. What it is? Yeah, yeah. Tetrafolate. So correct. it slows down because it uses, it's, it's, it uses like twice as much um, enzyme function yep. of DHFR as dietary folate. So this is the important thing. Folate and folic acid are two completely different things right. folate is food folate yep. and f- and food folate is a mixture of of um you know folinic acid and methyl tetrahydrofolate and all kinds of other folate de- de- derivatives um i think they were called polyglutamates or something i that's think right. that's your folate derivatives yep. um so folate and folic acid is not the same right. thing folic acid that's that's funny isn't it because everyone's told to take that before they get pregnant yeah, um, so all your multivitamins. Yeah, most of multivitamins have them, not all, but multi, most multivitamins that are synthetic do have folic acid in there, um, which is which is quite tragic. So, so okay, so so we're we're looking at these these genes that have this thing that we we can we can sort of modify the genes is what you're saying, and we can modify them using special nutrients. Now you mentioned Sammy before, essential methionine. That's also very good for for your moods as well, isn't it? So if you can mm. make more of that. You're going to feel better in the long term. Absolutely, wow. you know, because that Sam is also needed to make right. adrenaline. Write this down. Um, we, <laughs> it's also I'm married, to, remember? <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll it'll give your wife more energy because it helps you to make more adrenaline, right? Oh, through the PNMT uh, gene. Yep. And it also helps you. It'll help her sleep better, which means that she's going to have more energy and feel better the next day because it helps the ASMT gene work to make uh, melatonin. Adrenaline, yep. Um, what else does it do? Well, you might be less irritable with me, do you think, or no, is that just me? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Steve. <laughs> what we've got to do is work on her phenotype, don't we? Now, mm. now let, let's. there's another big word we're getting into here. Phenotype is a merging of the environment with your genes, and it turns into your phenotype is exposed. So, like, we have all these terms and SNPs and epigenomes, but really they are just different expressions of the genes. Because if... If genes were all you had and, you know, oh, I've got this bad gene here, therefore I'm going to get this, like Huntington's is probably an exception to that because you typically do go, that means you can actually modify these genes. Now, let's talk about macronutrient diets mm. because there's certain, you know, like the biggest debate in the world is how much carbohydrate, fat and protein we should eat. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, I mean, if it's one discussion that will get everyone on Facebook nuts, is how much should you eat of each? Now, while this is not a diet podcast, this is very closely related to your genes because you found a study, it was about 10 years ago, wasn't it? Do you want to talk yeah. about that study? So um, I, you know, I read about it a long time ago yeah. and today I tried to find it and I, and I eventually found it. It's actually a Norwegian study. It was done by the Norwegian University of Science and Technology mm. around 2011. And it was called Feed Your Genes, How Our Genes Respond to the Foods We Eat. Wow. And so they kind of like looked at diet in terms of the macronutrients. Mm. So there's your carbs, your proteins, and your fats. Mm. Uh, and generally they find that the average, you know, in, this is in Norway, but I think it's probably very similar across the world, that most, people, most people's diets or meals consist of about 65% carbohydrates. Sure. And then the rest protein and, you know, and fats. Mm. And so what they found is they, they did these studies and they did take genetic vari- vari- variations into account between mm-hmm. people as well. And they found that the ideal diet from a genetic perspective, so we're not talking you know, necessarily like weight loss mm-hmm. or anything mm-hmm. like that, was a third protein, a third carbohydrate and a third fat. Oh, and they found that as soon as the carbohydrate component went over a third for that meal, uh, a lot of the inflammatory and disease-causing genes like diabetes and all of those kinds of genes were switched on. Wow. Yeah, which was just like... That's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. So, you know, anyone who thinks that diet is not important when it comes to disease or, uh, f- you know, g- genetics, but even phenotypes, yes. um, you know, is, is sadly mistaken. And it does make me wonder, I just thought about it, Steve, like how how much diet would be... Uh, play or uh, uh, have an influence um, in during pregnancy. You know, women eating a diet 
where genes get switched on or switched or keep switch, being switched off mm. and how that affects um, the phenotype of the offspring uh, of the babies. I don't know, but it just popped into my head. <laughs> I love how we call babies offspring. <laughs> Typical sign. <I> <laughs> They're just offspring. That's right. Just, <laughs> They're offspring. Just little... And how are your offspring today? <laughs> now, now, just to go back here, one of the mechanisms could be surrounding um, uh, when, when genes replicate. Now, this thing called a cell cycle in the body, I'll just run down a little bit of, sorry, this will nerd you out a bit. But basically, when the genes replicate, they go through four phases, okay? We got G1, S, G2, and mitosis mm. phase. So you, they synthesize. Now, if you have too much of a hormones like insulin and estrogen in your body, then that speeds up the cell cycle. So you get faster replication of the cells. Now, that might sound, oh, more cells. But if you speed up the replication of the cells, and these, these groups of chemicals are called cyclins, then they drive the cell cycle forward, and you you're more likely to make mistakes mm. in the genomes. Now, you know, like like if I said to um, you know you, I'll oh, photocopy this a hundred times really quickly. Do it now. You go, ha, 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 and you might make a mistake. Yeah. Okay. That's what your genes are doing. They make a mistake. Now, a genetic mistake is a problem because it has to be fixed, or the cell dies, or you get the big C, or you get all sorts of other problems going on in the body, which is is hugely problematic. So your genes probably don't like too many cyclins. And they're also regulated by certain chemicals that slow down the cell cycle too. And these, they, these are like, there's a gene called P53, which is quite a common one. P21 slows down the cell cycle. And if you smoke, for example, you knock out P53, which is why the cell cycle speeds up when you smoke and you get lung cancer, which is a well-known side effect of smoking, and other cancers. You get breast cancers, all sorts of things from smoking. And this is a well-known effect and it works via that mechanism and free radicals. So we've got these, these genes going on in these foods. So a perfect genetic diet, if we'll call it a genetic diet now, is a third each fats, proteins, carbohydrates. Let's say I have breakfast. Mm. <laughs> yes, your Twitbix, um, five, five a day Twitbix. I'm having my Twitbix for breakfast. The percentage here um, per 100 grams is it's 67% carbohydrate per 100 grams. There's 12 of um, protein and about one point something grams. So out of all that, the rest of it's just fibers and stuff. So out of the 80, it's about 60. So we're, this is around about 80% carbohydrate food. Yeah. Now, why did I pick this food? It's because I asked Beck yesterday to get some at the... the <laughs> I don't eat this stuff, I promise you. I promise you. are going to throw it in the, in the rubbish bin. No, no, but this it. is like a common... You know, I remember an advert for Wheat Bix. Aussie big kids, I have Wheat Bix kids and Aussie kids. Wheat yeah. Bix kids. You know, so it's quite a common breakfast cereal. Now, it's a five-star rated breakfast cereal, as you can see on the packet there. So five just Five-star rated? There you go. Look at that. No way. <laughs> oh, I didn't make it up. Oh, my goodness. Look at it's five-star rated. It's, it's, it's a little bit processed because nothing in nature is shaped like that, is it? <laughs> you know? No. So, um, you know, this is, this is interesting because this is a – now, I've picked this one because I could have picked Fruit Loops or Cocoa Pops, which is worse. But this is a um, – Well, it's a, kind of considered a healthy, like, a healthy cereal because uh, it's supposedly high fiber and all of that. Mm. Although I would, uh, I would kind of contest that. I think the packaging is probably healthier than the contents. <laughs> well, possibly, but it gets worse because what do we typically put on that is sugar. Okay, and people say, "Oh no, I put fruit on mine." It's like, well, yeah. anyway, and then you put milk on that. Now, milk has a lot of gene-altering substances in it. Mm. IGF one is a classic thing called insulin-like growth factor one. Remember that cyclin thing? Yeah. That thing speeds up the cyclin process quite readily. So, this is a very common breakfast cereal that's commonly eaten with milk and sugars. Okay, that's not, I'm not blowing anyone's mind away. Or you could have Cocoa Pops or Fruit Loops. They're more sugary. So think of that, and remember you're bathing your genes in your lot, but people are bathing their genes in that every day. Yeah. Every day. Yeah. And with milk. So, so you start off your day yep. like switching pretty bad genes on. Okay, so for morning tea I'll have a muffin, whole blueberry muffin. Yeah. How am I going? Yeah, not so good so far, Steve. Not so good. And the reason why not so good is because it's mostly fire and sugar, isn't it? Yeah. And it's got blueberries in it, which is, you know, smattering, but, you know. But also the browning of it is that Millard reaction. So that's a terrible, uh, you know, free radical damaging thing that forms advanced glycosylated end products, which stuff your genes up. Mm. You know, so we're not going so well, are we? And then we'll have um, sandwich for lunch with white or brown bread, doesn't matter, with some uh, margarine on it. 
That's yeah. all right, isn't it? So margarine, no, I guess so. Yeah, you're going, you're going well <laughs> so far. But this is not an unusual. I'm not quoting anything absolutely unusual. So, so you know, this is what can we can bathe our genes in. Now, we're going to talk a bit more about polymorphisms, like the comp one. I've, I've picked a few examples here, and I won't go there through their, 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 their names, but this is the ANG PTL4 polymorphism. Now, I've picked on this polymorphism because it's a really good one because it actually, if you've got this polymorphism, everyone thinks polymorphism, oh, it must be bad. This actually protects against strokes oh. if you've got this polymorphism. So, so you know, there are good things that can be changed. So um, this is a, a good thing. It actually reduces uh, ischemic growth, which is when you have a stroke in your brain, there's two types. Your brain can bleed and you reduce blood flow because it bleeds out and the brain dies. Or you can get what's called a, an ischemic growth, which is a, a blockage in your brain so the brain dies. This is the ischemic growth and this actually reduces your incidence of that. Wow, so it's a polymorphism that you know we all think is bad and all this sort of stuff these things but it protects against stroke and that's important i'm glad you used the word polymorphism steve yeah. because that's generally like you know um a lot of us are moving away from the word mutation yes because saying like you've got a gene mutation is uh, has got a negative connotation yeah. and all that it really means is there's uh, the the gene it's a different um allele it's just mm. um a different version of yeah. the same gene. Mm. And so saying a polymorphism just says it's a different version mm. and that version could mean nothing, mm. it could be good or it could be bad, right? And so we need, you're right, we need to stop thinking of them all as you know problematic um, because it's, um, you know, a lot of these g genetic polymorphisms are actually adaptive mechanisms yes. uh, through evolution where mm. our genes had to kind of change mm. um, to adapt to, you know, whatever is going on. You know, yeah. I think famine was a big one where genes started to change through through famine in, in, in history. Um, it's so called the thrifty gene, which, which enables you to survive through famines a lot better than people who don't have that. So yeah. that genetic profile has, has gone through like our Aboriginal cultures here. Are you got to remember that, that mutations aren't that bad or polymorphisms aren't that bad. We talked about the MTHFR one, but if you've got one of those mutations, you actually can have typically slightly more strength, they found in one study. Oh. So more physical strength. Now, in, in evolutionary terms today, you've got more strength. It's like, yeah, I can pick this up as a bit more than you. It doesn't matter. But in an evolutionary point of view, when you're hunting and gathering, you might be able to tackle a larger game, eat more, and survive in that. So that mutation or gene would become an advantage. And remember, in the um, you know, in the caveman days, you want to call it that, we would eat a lot of fresh vegetables. We didn't fortify our breakfast with folic acid. So we had no. lots of foliage in our diet because we ate that we mainly ate. And so it didn't matter if you had a, a methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase polymorphism all, but if you had more strength, all the better to you. So now that's become a disadvantage. And it's like having um, um, more melanin in the skin, darker skin. That would be an advantage if you were going across the African savannah yeah. hunting. You'd get less sunburn and less cancers and all that sort of stuff. But if you took that genome and put them in Northern Ireland, where my ancestors are from, and Scotland and those areas, they would make less vitamin D and therefore you would uh, have more problems with low vitamin D status mm. because you didn't have that fair skin. And in fair, speaking of vitamin D, there's called VDRs, which are vitamin D receptor polymorphisms. Yep. And I've got one of those too. Really? Yes. And so when, when you've got that, it means you need more vitamin D than the average pundit. So like the average dose in, in the blood is five to, uh, 50 to 150 vitamin D. I have to keep mine closer to 150 because my receptors are just a bit shitty. <laughs> they're, not, they're still there, yeah. but that predisposes me to more arthritic conditions because vitamin D keeps a lid on inflammation. That's right. And then from an epigenetic perspective, if you've got the VDR gene, yep. um, uh, Steve-O. Uh, Which I have. <laughs> which you have, um, then that means that you really got to take care of your gallbladder yep. because VDR is a um, bile activated uh, nuclear receptor, Correct. I believe, um, which means that you need bile acids to kind of bind to receptors like VDR to mm. kind of activate them. Mm. But not just that, there are also certain viruses that can bind to VDR or the vitamin D receptor and oh. stop vitamin D from binding to it. Like I think, um, I think EBV may be one of them epstein-barr virus yep so you got to be you know aware of a viral in interactions with genes like this as well so if you already have a slow vdr which i do then if you get like a, something like a, a viral infection mm. or you know your gallbladder is not working that great that could slow it down even more um, and affect that whole vitamin d cycle i'm stuffed aren't i 
Well, no. No. Um, one good thing about um, having my HLA B 2017 thing is it was a South African study um, where it was protective against developing AIDS because it oh. hyped up your immune system, particularly interleukin 17. That's good news. And yeah, you know, it's great news if you're worried about being exposed to that. But if you're married like me, I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about getting the arthritis. But it's very interesting that these genes are not bad nor good. They're just different for the circumstances. You measured evolution before, and evolution by natural selection was a Darwinian process where uh, a, a change in the genes occurred, and if it was unsuccessful change, that lineage would die off. Mm. But if it was a positive one, then you would, you would survive. And this is where we, we came from Homo habilis and Homo erectus and all these guys, that they developed changes over time. And over millions of years, you became the successful, you know, us, Homo sapiens. Well, uh, I, I, I'm starting to wonder if we're really that successful. <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah. Well, if you compare it to our, our cousins, the Neanderthals, that didn't last too well, about 25 well, years in the early. Well, we seem to get a bit unhealthier and unhealthier as the human race goes along. You hey, know? A Neanderthal would have made a fantastic front rower these days and, and would be one of those footballers that are running around getting drunk everywhere because they were very strong and they were good at that. Their brains were slightly smaller than ours. But, um, you know, our, our, our brains had to sort of evolve to the, the changing environments, like the, the massive changes in our weather uh, over the last, you know, eons, millions of, or hundreds of thousands of years has formed our brains to be quite large and only for survival of the fittest. And another study here on ankylosing spondylitis where we have a lot of interleukin-17. Um, and interleukin-17 is a pro-inflammatory chemical, which now they've developed um, drugs like toxizumumab, which is a fantastic drug for knocking out interleukin-17. And that's a drug used for ankylosing spondylitis these days. But if you've got a lot of interleukin-17, you get less prone to certain infections in the gut. Oh. So, so it's you know protective I mean? against that. It's protective against that. that that's what TL17 interleukin-17 does. So we've got these, you know, um, you know, some interesting genes which are good and bad. And I've got another one for you. Uh, this gene... Um, is the RS9939609 polymorphism. You might go, what's that? That's the fat gene. Ah, everyone would be interested in the fat gene. <laughs> Everyone's interested in the fat gene. But, but this is a gene that, that means that you'll be more predisposed to a dietary inflammatory index score and more pro prone to um, obesity. Now, what they've found is that this, brain, this is associated with obesity, but it doesn't mean you'll get obesity. It just means that, you know, Joe Sixpack who eats this compared to the obese Joe Sixpack with this gene means that they eat weak because they get fat. Mm. This person doesn't. And this is why diets are so confusing because you'll, you'll, you'll see someone on Insta, Insta, Insta Facebook or whatever it is, uh, <laughs> one of the two, um, talking about, you know, oh, you've got to eat carbs to be, look at me, I'm lean, they've got a photo of themselves, high carbs. Because you get those skinny guys, right, and they eat the yeah. worst food ever and they don't put on weight. I'm thinking of one Michael Galley, who's a salesman here who eats um, usually very well, but sometimes when I've hung out with him, not so well, but he's super duper Adonis, isn't he? Brooklyn knows him, he's... he's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's He's a god body. He's got really good body. And he's, you know, not young anymore. I'd say how old he is, but he's not my age. He's not that old. But he's, you know, he's, he's not 20 anymore. And he is extraordinarily lean and healthy. And, and he's just got this, this genome that must, must love him. And, yep. you know, he does exercise a lot too, so he's very good. So it's very good. So we've got these genes and these polymorphisms that are going on. Um, you know, there, there's one here with, with associated with the risk of osteoarthritis. So, you know, some people get it, some people don't. Why? One of the reasons is the RS64-26749 gene. And you might think, what's all these RS things? That's, that's when you get those genome tests. And it just means you're predisposed to these. Now, the ethical question is, do you get these genes um, tested or do you just sort of what, he's, he's no real right answer to this one, but I've asked you this question. Would I invest money in my genome testing or would I invest money on, you know, generally good supplements, good lifestyle and good health? Which, which way or would you kind of try and do a mix of both? What, what would you recommend for anyone listening out there? Yeah, so in general, I would be spending money more on investing in my health, you know, mm. on f good food, you know, organic food, because organic food is a little bit more expensive. Mm. Um, you know, uh, maybe supplements if you're, mm. let's say, a vegan and there's certain nutrients that you are going to miss out that you can't get through dietary sources. You know, I'd be investing my money into like a gym membership and mm. doing some exercise, for instance, or what have you. Um, the, the, the time when genomic testing becomes very valuable, though, is more 
more in people who have uh, chronic symptoms. It doesn't even have to be a, a serious disease or anything like that. It could be something like, let's say, endometriosis, mm. as an example. And they've done everything right. They do yep. have a healthy lifestyle. They've done everything right. They still don't know. You know, then th- tests like these can actually become very helpful. Um, or just getting your genes tested and not willing to make the lifestyle changes. Mm. It's kind of like a bit of a waste of time and a bit of waste of money. Sure, it gives you maybe some information, mm. um, but if you know, it'll only be helpful if you are of the viewpoint my genes are my destiny, and yeah. that's just how it is. Um, but I'd say first, you know, you you make sure that you do all the right things from a, an epigenetic perspective. Um, And, you know, maybe then do gene testing. And even then, if you do decide to do genome testing or gene testing, you have to, you you can't just take gene tests on its own. You have to, and this is not if you have symptoms or uh, some chronic illness or something, Mm. you have to look at functional tests Mm. in conjunction with your genetic tests. Genetic tests on its own doesn't tell you anything. Your functional testing will tell you which of those genes are being expressed. So I explain to people, like, imagine your genes, because it's your blueprint, Mm -hmm. imagine it as the first layer. Mm. Then you have the second and the third Mm. layer, which is all these epigenetic Mm. factors on top of Mm. it. Um, And that's kind of like, you know, if you take your genes is the blueprint for building a house. Um, The uh, uh, if if your blueprint is skew, you're going to build a skew looking house kind Mm. of thing. Right. Mm. The material of the house is then, you know, that the bricks and the mortar and all of that is your 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 nutrients and all the ep- other epigenetic factors mm. so you may even if you have a perfect blueprint you could still if your if your materials were rubbish you're still going to have a pretty sad looking house right or not a strong house i should say um and that's mm. why and, and from my experience because i uh, you know i do a lot of genetic testing and also um uh, functional testing. I've seen a lot of people who take MTHFR as an example, who have the polymorphisms, and they are not expressing it when we look at their tests. Mm. And I've seen people with no polymorphisms, and when we do testing, they are expressing an MTHFR, um, I guess, uh, polymorphism. Even though they don't have it, they're expressing it. Ah. And so, um, you know, you have to be careful not to get too caught up in the genetics because it's it's a small part of the big picture um it tells you your blueprint and it's of course very important but the lifestyle stuff and the diet stuff is so much more important Mm. and to go back to the diet you know when we talked about the perfect gene Mm. diet Mm. what they also found which was really interesting is that you can actually change your genetic expression very quickly so let's say you you eat like the high carb meals you know mcdonald's every day and yeah your wheat picks every day every morning for breakfast if you switch to a third, third, third pro- of, between your macros, mm. um, I think it was something like two weeks. Like within two weeks, you could change your genetic expression. You could switch all of those genes off, those those disease-causing wow. genes off. So it actually happens really quick. Mm. I mean, it'll take some time for you to see the results mm. of mm. that mm. switching mm. off, right? Mm. Because it takes some time for inflammation to go away and for you to lose weight and all mm. of that kind of stuff. But it happens very quick, and that's good news mm. because it's like it's not doesn't it's not going to take you years and years and years. You can you can stop the risk of developing chronic illness later in life fairly quickly just by changing the diet, you know, changing your diet. And I think that's mm. that's empowering. You know, you have control, which I think is positive. It's 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 absolutely phenomenal that you can change your gene expression in two weeks based on a healthy diet. And unfortunately, th- this sort of third, third, third diet is, in, in Australia, I've, I, I, I would assume most health professionals would say, oh, that's too high in protein or too high in fat and you need more complex carbohydrates. I hate that term, complex carbohydrates, because mm. this is complex carbohydrates, you know, full stop. And, and, you know, it's not that complex when it goes in your body, it turns into sugar. Mm. That's what it does. It doesn't turn into muscle, it turns into sugar. Now, you might need carbohydrates because you're running three marathons a day and that's fine but i mean it's very processed too there's no yeah. nutrients in it which is bad for you it's got the folic acid in it which is bad um you know it's got a few other vitamins in it which is you know all synthetic and stuff so so you know we can change our 
our, our, our system there, which is absolutely extraordinary. And having a third, 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 I love that that simplicity. Yeah. 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 And so, you, so you'd be wanting to also, if you eat carbohydrates, you don't eat this stuff. You eat the colourful fruits, vegetables, salads. The unprocessed complex unprocessed, carbohydrates. Unprocessed complex carbohydrates. I like that because complex carbohydrates were all considered good and until we figured out the biochemistry of it. Um, there's a few other things here. We, we know, for example, there's, there's dopamine receptor polymorphisms, which enables you to become food addicted. Yes, DRD2, DRD3 are the big yep. ones. Yeah. That's right. So, so you know, um, in this paper, they, they just looked at the two form and what they found in these people, um, you know, that you'll say to them, hey, stop eating chocolate, and they can't. Mm. And it's like, I'm, but, but, you know, I told you not to eat it. Mm, mm, mm. You know, and, and, and they'd use... Um, you, you hear these things with these sort of things, and, and my limited clinical experience is that they would sort of go, oh, but I just thought I'd give myself a little treat. And they used those sort of words that I was never really comfortable with when people would say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm just going to give my body a treat. So if you want to give your body a treat, go to the gym. Yeah. How to treat your body better than having sugar and chocolate. Yeah. So, but there are people that are, are predisposed to this. Yeah. And, you know, the treatment for eating disorders is super high dose Prozac. It's also, you know, with drug addiction. Yep. Um, you know, big one with uh, cocaine and heroin and yep. things like that with your DRD2, DRD3 genes. Yeah. So, you know, with those receptors, it's generally any kind of addictive behavior. Yeah. And we know that everyone has, you know, different vices, I guess. For some, yep. it may be gambling. For some, it may be sugar. Mm. You know, um, yeah. So Absolutely. Uh, it's incredible. It's much higher in women and men, too. So, you know, it's, it's an interesting one too. So another one you've got to look. Um, we talked about, um, you talked about the polymorphism MTHFR. Well, that's associated with pregnancy loss. And this is a major paper published in 14,000 subjects. So, you know, this is, this is one case where you, you could have that one gene tested for if you're a young woman and you're wanting to fall pregnant. You could look out for that sort of thing or get a blood test like a homocysteine, mm. which is a measure of how well you're methylating or a subsequent measure which can be bulk build. So you can look at those sorts of things too. There are genes associated with, with coronary artery atherosclerosis, which is the biggest killer in Australia. And yeah. um, coronary artery calcification. Calcification is where you can get your arteries in your heart measured to see for any plaque build up there. An incredible test that actually can predict if you're going to have a heart attack within the next five, ten years. Wow. Incredible. Incredible technology. I mean, my, my father-in-law was, was great when, when he talked about testing. He yeah. said, I would only test – and he's been a GP for 50 years. He said, I only test people who gave blood tests if they were going to change something or change the treatment. Yeah, otherwise it's you're yeah. wasting your money, aren't you? Yeah, well, I mean, if I said, oh, look, I'm just interested in my genes, you know, we're not interested in changing anything, don't bother. What are you going to – oh, I've got this gene. Oh, well, who cares? I'm not going to change anything. So I'd rather, I mean, we kind of know what's healthy for us. I mean, that, that dietary information is good. Or third, third, third. We kind of know that exercising, eating well is good for us anyway. So, I mean, do we waste, well, not waste, but do we use the money on testing for genes or do we just do the good stuff? Absolutely. You know what I mean? It's yeah. very interesting, isn't it? I love that. And so, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of information on polymorphisms here, um, which, is, which is absolutely incredible. But I guess... Um, now, I think you've got one more study there that you wanted to talk about there. I'm not too oh, sure. Are you talking about the agouti y yes. mice? Yes. I didn't end up uh, printing it out, but um, oh. uh, it was a still, you know, if, if I remember the, the, the study correctly, it was a, a mice study where they took, um, they fed mice different nutrients because generally, you know, uh, this was a specific species of mice and they yep. come out a, a certain color and a certain size. Mm -hmm. And they fed uh, the, one, the one lot all kinds of methylated nutrients, so the folates yep. and the B12s and, you know, a healthy, nutritious mm -hmm. kind of um, formula. And then the other rats got like, I guess, what they call rat chow. <laughs> it's generally... What, the old rat chow. The old <laughs> rat chow, which is generally like, a, you know, fat and carbs mixed yeah. together. Yeah. And it was just fascinating because the offspring yeah. of the mice that were fed the two different ones, so the ones that got all the methylating nutrients came out, you know, with brown fur, small and all of that. And the other mice, all the offspring were like these big, fat, yellow <laughs> mice, obese, yellow, with a yellow fur. And the, 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 the lesson oh, of I that... I shouldn't laugh. Terrible, <laughs> terrible, well, they terrible. Look, they look pretty funny if you looked at them next yeah. to each other. But the, the lesson of that is that nutrients... Um, especially during pregnancy, mm. so I think this is really important for women to understand, is nutrient intake during pregnancy 
you know, has the ability to change the phenotype. Mm. You know, you can't really change the genetics. No. You, you give, you transfer your genes to your um, offspring, yes. <laughs> your babies, right? Yes, of course. Uh, your children. Um, but it has the ability to change the phenotype of are those, um, you know, are your, is your children more likely to maybe... Um, suffer from obesity or, mm. or what have you. So it's very important to have a healthy nutritional intake as much as you can. Look, this is not about um, shaming women. I mean, my diet was pretty atrocious when I was pregnant because you crave all kinds of funny things. Um, but it's just a kind of a reminder that we need to make sure we don't run into deficiencies mm. of, uh, of nutrients during pregnancy. Well, you know, the classic one is cretinism, which is very common worldwide, not so much in Australia, where they get low iodine and the, and the babies turn out quite you know horrifically malnourished and mentally sort of you know deficient and that's that's horrendous disease very common we have iodized salt in australia and all this sort of stuff but that's a classic example of that so and that's an extreme example so we've got to be careful of, of those sorts of things and and, and it's really interesting that the talk on genes and polymorphisms it's it's sort of like you know it, it gets that age-old question is do we test for it or do we just treat ourselves well I'm, I'm in your camp i'd rather you know i went to the gym this morning i, you know, I eat well i don't any i I'm, I'm don't eat this stuff was just brought in for props but <laughs> but you know it's 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 really fascinating the whole genome story because we have got our genes we are stuck with them but we can change the epigenetics the expression of them through eating a third 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 loads of nutrients and antioxidants and good multivitamin exercise getting our stress level sorted. Sure, you may be more prone to diseases, but you don't have to get them. Absolutely, absolutely. Anything you'll add to that to sort of... Oh, Steve, I think we've covered... I mean, this is such a big topic. Oh, we can talk forever, but I, know. I think we've definitely covered the basics, yep, you know, before getting too technical. I know, <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm biting my tongue a bit. But we, we don't, you know, people don't want to get technical. They just want to know that genes are important for us. And, and I think it's very important that people know that that they do exist and we can not change the genes but change the, the expression. expression of the genes yeah oh, that's that's fascinating we've got to do a part two on this like i think it. we should yes yeah. but um all right well i guess that's it for now isn't it that's it for now so it was you know, nice all having... right. I might go and have some breakfast now eh? <laughs> oh, <what? laughs> all right well this has been elizabeth and steve and thank you for listening again today on genes and um we'll see you all next week yeah bye guys have a great day mm-hmm.